Hello and a very big warm welcome to this week's edition of the Soul Sync Podcast. Now, first of all, for the very eagle-eyed amongst you wondering, why was there not an episode last week, Jason? I will tell you, I was on holiday in Greece um, with my family. I had a lovely time, got very pink, and dare I say it, I was even too hot at times. But I'm back and it's great to be back. Now, just before we get on with this week's edition... I have over on my YouTube channel been documenting some of my development and progress and the lessons learned on my journey in mediumship. So if you're interested to find out more about my journey with my mediumship, just go over to my YouTube channel by searching Jason Paul Soulsync. So in this week's edition, we've got an incredible guest for you with a truly um, remarkable story. So without further ado, let me introduce to you Richard Stuttle, who is a medium, a spirit artist and a healer. Now, Richard's journey is as diverse as it is inspiring. From his background in hospitality to traversing the globe as a chef, to the tragic loss of his sister Caroline in 2002, Richard's path has been shaped by profound experiences that have led him to his current position as an artist, healer and medium. Now, as the founder of Caroline's Rainbow Foundation, a travel charity aimed at preparing young travellers for their journeys abroad, Richard's commitment to helping others navigate life's challenges really does shine through in all facets of his work. But Richard's journey really doesn't stop there. He's a passionate spirit artist and intuitive healer. And Richard channels his creativity and spiritual gifts to bring healing and inspiration to others from demonstrating mediumship in churches all around the world to painting fine art and intuitive pieces Richard's work is a testament to the power of art and mediumship as forms of healing. Now, in this episode, Richard is going to be sharing with us insights into his personal journey. Enjoy. So, Richard, firstly, a massive warm welcome onto the Soul Sync podcast. Oh, Jason, thank you ever so much. It's certainly a privilege to be here. Now... When I when I always start these episodes, uh, the first thing I do is look at the very helpful back information that guests provide to me. And when I was reading through your b- backstory and what you do, I thought to myself, my goodness, we're going to have a lot to talk about in this hour um, because there's a lot to your story and what you do. And obviously, I've just introduced um, you, um, but tell us a bit about your story because it, it it really touched my heart when I read it. So I mean I my I was very privileged um as a as a child and growing up and I don't mean that financially I mean it more in the sense that um I grew up in a in a safe secure environment and I was never told anything was wrong uh, regarding anything spiritual um or anything to do with nature I was always encouraged um and anything with creativity and art which mm-hmm. I think is so important um so from that point of view and the, the the early years were certainly fantastic I suppose the start where where the story um really hits home is is with my sister so we were really as as young people and as uh, you know teenagers there was five years between me and Caroline and um we we traveled as a family we traveled independently um very much encouraged to go go you know explore the world follow your dreams that that confidence as a young person to try and step out into the world um <clears throat> caroline did that on her own and went off to australia backpacking and uh, she was 19 she went with a friend of hers and I mean, I encouraged her to go. At that time, I was working in the French Alps um, doing winter seasons, which were were fantastic. So anything to do with travel, we very much loved. Um, halfway through her adventure, or not even that, she was working her way up the East Coast, found herself a place called Bundaberg. And um, one night she was walking across a bridge um, on her way back to where she was staying at uh, nine o'clock at night. It was dark. Um, in the evening, and um, she got stopped on this bridge. Someone wanting her belongings, someone wanting to um, to take what she had. Uh, she wasn't willing to let that go, and there was a scuffle, and and this guy threw her over the bridge and tragically um, lost her life. That really 
well, apart from devastating our family, um, really shaped the the next twenty odd years of my life. You know that that kind of opened the door to those questions of where is she now? What happens when you die? What's the point of this world? Why is life so fragile yet so robust? Um, all of those questions started flooding in, and of course, dealing with that grief and that emotion. And, and trying to process all of that. And of course, it was a, at the time, 2002, it was it was a high profile case because it was someone who was a British backpacker who had lost her life in Australia oh. and found, a, found, found international news. Um, so we were thrown under, under the spotlight, really. Um, so trying to deal with that, the, the media attention, what do we do for Caroline's legacy? Um, her her life force, her passion for life, because we obviously knew her incredibly well and and knew the person she was. And and we felt that we couldn't just let her passing go in vain, you know. So so that really was the starting point for for this this chapter that, that has seemed to be on ongoing for 20 odd years. <laughs> what what a thing to have to deal with. How how did you even what what was the journey what after it it, it kind of happened to you sort of delving into you know the mysteries of existence where did you go and what how did you get through that period it was it was very dark um to start off with certainly um our, our family had uh, my parents were divorced at that time um so i i was really the only one left in in our family home um and it was it was very much as a space where i needed to be to process and just be alone with my own thoughts and really delve into that darkness a little bit try and deal with that that loss of you know a sibling and and at the time there wasn't much information about that there was a lot of information about grieving for for parents and the loss um of a child um, but for siblings, it's very different. And I couldn't imagine what it's like to lose a child. You know, it's 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 the most heartbreaking thing uh, that I've seen. Um, obviously, with my parents and other families that have gone through similar tragedies. But to deal with the loss of a sibling is something a little bit different because you're yeah. supposed to go on that journey. You're supposed to outlive your parents. You're supposed to you know, be lifelong friends and go to each other's weddings, of celebrate course. their kids, do, yeah. you know, it's, it's a, it's, it would have been or, or should have been, um, you know, a, a 70, 80 year journey for the pair of us. And as it turned out, it was, it was 19 years. Um, so there was all of that to process. And to be honest, it took, it took many years. It took many, many years for me to, to unpack some of those boxes and and really come to terms with her not being here, but also um, the things that I'd done or the things that I hadn't done. You know, when you're young kids and you're you're playing and you know, I mean, we were very lucky because we were close and we'd had some special moments. She'd come out to see me in the Alps and. I'd got to see her before she left for Australia, you know, so I had said, I love you. I had said these things that were really important mm. um, and really, really pivotal. Although I didn't, the, the strange thing is that there was the last conversation we had and she phoned me, I was in the Alps um, in a working and she phoned up and we, we had a conversation and her, her phone credit, you know, because she were on pay phones back then. We, we yes. And her phone credit ran out. So our conversation was cut short. And I, I felt something really awkward about that. And I thought, oh, that's strange. But because we didn't think too much of it, just thought, oh, her credit's run out. Mm. It's only in hindsight when you look back and you felt, hang on, there was a bit of a jarring there. What was that? You know, and, and that was the last time that I spoke to her. So it was it was trying to come to terms with all of that. Um, and then obviously opening the door for for where is she now for for what's happened and, and where's she going when was it that you started to look at things like where where has she gone at what point sort of after her passing was that um it, it wasn't long after because i'd i'm 
I've always been interested in philosophy or the way that the life is, the way that creativity unfolds for people. Um, so it wasn't long after. The, the strange things that happened, because I was in the family house by myself, you know, and whether it was um, objective or subjective, I don't know, but I was in the, I was in my bedroom and, it, you know, late at night or whatever, not sleeping, obviously. And she used to play the organ and we had an organ downstairs and, and I could hear it playing. Uh, and you just think, oh, wow. <laughs> uh, uh... whether it was, it was subjectively or objectively to this day, I don't know, but I was too afraid at that point to get, you know, it was more put your head under the covers and, oh, my goodness, is this well, I think I would have been the same, Richard, <laughs> given the, the, the circumstances. So, so where did you go from there? So so that was that was a point where I thought there's people around, there's, there's something around. Um, there were stories from when my sister was little um, where she'd gone to see my dad after, you know, one morning and said, oh, there's there's a man at the end of my bed and he's talking, but I can't hear him and I can see straight through him. So she could wow. see spirit. Um, I've never, never seen spirit, but, but she, she was, um, she was someone who was, who was very in touch. What really clinched it for me around that time was if you're sat in a room and, and someone, you know, someone walks in, you don't see them, you feel their presence walk in yes. if yeah. they're here. And I'd be sat in, in the, in the living room or whatever, and I would feel her walk in. And but obviously she she wasn't here. But that said to me that there's something around with energy and there's she is still around or some part of her is still around because I could feel it. And it wasn't something I'd read. It wasn't something that, you know, I mean, watching the X-Files when you're a kid or whatever. It was something <laughs> that I could actually feel um, and I could feel her presence. And and that was really clinched it for me that I, I wanted to go on a journey and find out well what happens where is she what is energy and where did that prompt you to go and look um, because I, I think we have to remember as well back in that time obviously the internet was a thing but it certainly isn't what it is now oh and very much so I mean I mean I was lucky you know my my father's um <clears throat> worked at the Arthur Finlay College he was a tutor there for 30 years oh so wow Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that I was wasn't, lucky. I, wasn't it lucky? I said, Dad. Yeah. Uh, where, where? Uh, uh, <laughs> but so, so it wasn't. Um, it wasn't something that was out of the ordinary. Um, working with the spirit world and understanding it. Not that I understood it myself, but I was aware that there were mediums. I was aware that there were healers. I was aware that that there was communication. Um. Not that at that time, I think I'd been to the college. I went first time to the Arthur Finley when I was 19. Um, so, and I, I, Caroline passed when I was 25. So I'd been a couple of times. Oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. But not really done anything than gone and enjoyed the college. And uh, because I liked painting and stuff, I did some drawing and some art. And I'd done um, done the the spirit art drawing and the workshops, you know, and, and the, the the course. Uh, but not really looked into it any deeper than that. Just, you know, like you do at that age, you sort of explore a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of, of something else. So yeah. I was I was just sort of um, feeling out what I liked and, and what I wanted. And then, of course, life got in the way a little bit because we set up the charity. We wanted to to do something in this world for Caroline's legacy. Um, we obviously had to deal with... Um, the 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 trial and the the court case and everything for the the guy who who was eventually um um sent down he was he was sentenced for 15 years um for for murder um so we had all of that going on at that time um 2003 i i left to go to australia and i did two years backpacking and and that was really when i had the time to myself and i was going on my my own journey nobody knew who i was which was brilliant in that sense because in york in the uk 
my my picture the family was was quite you know there was there was the media was camped out of our outside of our house for for a couple of weeks when it first happened oh, and what a, everybody what a thing was, to have to deal with yeah, so of, so yeah. it was it was a lovely escape for me um to go to australia and i wanted to follow i was surprised you wanted to go there off uh, oh, out I, of all places i had no choice it was one of those things that you just want to go. You know, I had no choice to go. Um, one, I wanted to go and, and visit the places that Caroline never got to see. And right. two, I wanted to go and stand at the places that she went to and stood. You know, she she made it to, to Byron Bay. She was in Sydney. She was doing these these amazing amazing uh, places and, and visiting these these iconic locations because you know you, everybody knows the harbour bridge and the opera house you know so they i want to go and do that and um i really wanted to to represent the family at the the trial which happened in 2004 so you know go and represent our family and caroline's memory you know i felt it was important for me to do that so there was a very much a, a, a sense of I had to deal with this grief. We had to set up a charity. I really had to grow up and and get on with it. You know, it was it was a huge transition those those few years. Um, but yeah, you, a lot that, you even was... wrote a book. Um, I'm so, not sure when the book was published, but you know, the... um, no, it was 2021. The the book was published. So when I when I went to Australia. Um, I thought I'm going to record this, so I wrote, I started writing a diary every day. Um, oh. So, and then I've written a diary every day since, which is is just something. It's only a page a day, but it's it's something that is just gives you a little bit of discipline and kind of records what you do each day. You know, it's it's probably the only discipline I've got. But it's, oh, it's well, do you know what? I'm actually quite <laughs> jealous that you you you're doing that because I've said to myself. It's so many times, right? I'm going to do it, and then I do it for a few days, and then I forget. And it is discipline. It is discipline to do it. So I do it agree is, with you there. Is. It's it's nice to to sit back. So so I had all these diaries, and I had um, the full in in different scrappy little diaries when I was traveling. You know, little notebook. <laughs> but I wrote pretty much every day. Um, and then when you know the, we did the charity, the years went by, and um, a few years ago, four or five years ago, I just I kind of put down and I said. I, I want to really mark the milestones of the charity. I want to tell Caroline's story um, and I want to publish the diary because it's it's not at that time. What what Instagram tells you traveling is, is not the reality of backpacking. No. Um, so yeah. so I, I really wanted to to give that 18 months that I was in Australia, those diary entries, the little pencil sketches I'd done, um, the artwork I'd done and all of that kind of stuff uh, to really put that down in a in a book. And I was very lucky. I got a publishing deal and, and they, they liked it. And 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 I was I was going to do it. But it was it would have been fine for me to just write one copy for myself. Um, but I felt it was important and an incredibly cathartic process for me to unpack more of those boxes that mm. I'd locked away deep deep inside of me back in 2002 so it what did was it feel like read that. when you had to go back and read all the diaries from that period oh, I was I was, to you? I, I was in I was in tears I was in um hysterics um a lot of the things that I'd forgotten I'd even done so it was it was fantastic in a in a way, but yeah, I mean, I was again, I was crying, I was I was laughing. It was was it healing in a way? Oh, even? very much so, yeah. very much so. I mean, that's that's really to me what what healing or where we go with healing is is unpacking those things from your past and and really processing those. Yeah those little things that we we lock away or we create little paradigms from and, and we add emotion to, to those memories and really compact that into something that maybe it isn't, you know? So the reality mm -hmm. of reading back the diaries was the reality of what happened at the time, not my memory and emotions that got attached to what I thought happened at the time, if that makes sense. Thank goodness that you had the diaries. Um, and yeah, even yeah. thought to for, for even thought to do that in the first place. 
Yeah, well, it was something around. I, I don't know why. You know, again, a lot of people's stories and and listening to your your podcasts, a lot of people's they just feel that urge to do it, don't they? Or there's just something inside. Yeah. That tells them. They, there's no rhyme or reason um, it, it, most yeah. of the time, and then it's only when you look back, you know, obviously with the benefit of hindsight. So, you know, like you said, um, kind of earlier on in, in the conversation, Caroline really has sort of been the catalyst for everything that's sort of happened in your life since. So your so your work in um, spirit art, how did that sort of start becoming a thing more than just you going and doing a bit of painting um, at the Arthur Findlay College? How did how did it even begin to evolve because I'm I'm struggling to picture but I'm going to link with a spirit now and start drawing them how did it start it's oh it's it's so <laughs> much fun um well I've done the spirit art um courses at the college um yes. and my father's an artist as well so so he's he's obviously done it there for 30 years and he's a professional artist in his own right as well um so I was always into drawing um and I was always into art so it was really about that proof of life after death. And, and when you look at mediumship, that's what it is. I wanted to prove to myself more than anyone else that, that there's something around this. And you look at people like Coral Poles, you look at people like Frank Lear, um, and what more proof can there be of a drawing of somebody you don't know with artifacts and, and things around the drawing um, that relate to them and can be recognizable as well as the mediumship and the evidence of this person and this spirit communicator. I mean, and the, the drawing can be matched to a photograph. Well, I, mean, I was going to say this to you earlier, <laughs> actually, that, that for me, there would be no better proof than a, than a picture that resembled that of my departed loved one. Um, yeah, I, I, I think as evidence goes, do you know what? Even if I had absolutely concrete evidence and then I had the photo on the other hand, I still think I would find the photo because you take it, you know, you can't, if it's on paper, then and the problem with a reading sometimes is you have a reading and then you go, and my, I've got the worst memory in the world anyway, Richard, I, I have a reading. I've, I've forgotten half of it by the time I've drove home, um, <laughs> which isn't good, but... So, yes, I agree with you that there is no better form of um, evidence. So when did you first sort of start dabbling in this more, if that's the right expression? Yeah, I, I suppose just doodling in, in sketchbooks. Doodling, uh, that's a better word. Doodling, yeah. Dabbling and doodling. Um, yeah, plenty of both. Um, <laughs> sketchbooks and, and just... Um, creativity and knowing that I'm not copying something I'm drawing somebody and I'd read Frank Lear's book which he was a fantastic illustrator but he started drawing people that they were you know he wasn't copying wasn't doing any life drawing and then people would come and recognize these drawings and say oh that's my granny that's my auntie and I thought this is ah. incredible so I, I started doing the same. I started drawing and 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 scribbling and and just seeing what information that came um, and and making little notes and things. Not 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 necessarily to place them, but just thinking where is the, or trying to feel where this information was coming from or who was this person. So at, the, at first, I was kind of just telling these little stories about people. Um, and that's where the, the creativity, you know, when you're an artist, you're, you're looking and you, you look at a landscape or you look at a scene and it's it's asking those questions of what's round the corner, what's behind the tree, what's what's on the other <laughs> side, what's in the river. You know, all of these things, when you look at a landscape that you, you look at some of the old masters, then it is you're trying to look round the corners of pictures. You're trying to look over yes. the brow of the hill, you know, and so it was it was an attempt for me to try and look over the brow of the hill into these people's worlds and try and get those little bits of information. Well, 
you know, why am I drawing some cufflinks? Well, what are the initials on the cufflinks? What color are the cufflinks? What are, you know, all these little questions when you start to, when you look at the mediumship, it's about deepening the evidence. So I could do that with, with um, doodles really. <laughs> you know? So when you were going through, see the process would be, you'd go to do, we'll say a doodle because that, that's the word we're using now. Um, <laughs> a sketch. A sketch. <laughs> yeah, a sketch. Okay. When you were first starting out, you so see, you would just sit down with your sketch pad and draw intuitively what's coming to you. Is that the, the process yeah. that you was following? Yeah, yeah, pretty much that. Just, just, um, and then it evolved. So, so just you know, you start with the eyes, or you start with, with then you put a nose in, and then it, oh no, that it feels like a bigger nose, or it feels like a smiley face, or oh, it, so you just hit something like. there because I was going to ask you that was going to be a question. So when you, how do you know that it's a spirit person and not your imagination? So it's it's well, that's when you develop the mediumship. So so I went to do courses um, uh, and and a mentorship with with people to to really develop the mediumship independently. Mm -hmm. So when you go back to the art, then you're you're kind of talking to yourself about this feels like this person. I know that this guy had a mustache. I know that these were the glasses that he wore. I know that he was a reader and these are the types of books that he would have had. You know, so you were really asking those questions. Now, when we're doing the the Dems and the 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 spirit art demonstrations, it's almost like you're flipping between the two. So one hand is doing the the art, and the the other part is doing the mediumship. Um, but they'll, I just feel it intuitively that they tell me, "Oh, my jaw wasn't like that," or "I want more detail here," which then says oh, a few things. Oh. It's talking about. <clears throat> A lot of it is about the spirit communicators and what they want um, and what kind of art. So I was always interested how my art work that I'd done independently had gone from landscapes to abstracts to impressionists. I'd gone through to almost hyperrealism stuff or photorealism. I'd gone through all these phases with the art, not really finding my own niche or, or finding my own style. Um, or seeing my own style within the art. Um, and now when you're doing the, the 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 spirit art, it's more in a sense of what the spirit communicator liked. So if they liked abstract art, the picture would be slightly more abstract. If they were a very detailed and um, and studious person in this life, then I would find myself spending a lot more detail on the eyes or a lot more detail on the features. And that would then tell me something because it, I know that that's not my style of art. I know that that's I wouldn't yeah. necessarily paint like that. And sometimes, that you know, they come sense. through with a lot of energy. You know, when you're you're working as a as a medium, you're you're working, and sometimes you become more animated. Or oh, this gentleman's making me sit up straight, and you know, I know that this guy, you know, would have been a a very. Has it ever shocked guy. you, like when you've done an artwork, especially when you were first starting out? And then maybe you saw a photo. Was there ever a moment where it was like, oh, my goodness, this is like almost, you know. Uh... Oh, every time. Every oh, every time. time? <laughs> every I didn't time realize it, it was every it, time. It, it, every time it shocks me. Oh, no, not necessarily. I don't see the photos every time. But oh. uh, so this is another another thing that I kind of talk about when before I do the Dems or whatever is um, getting your portrait done when you're in spirit is very much the same as getting your portrait done here. You want your best side. You know, so the spirit communicators and the spirit world is incredibly intelligent. They they sometimes come through younger than when they passed, because more than oh, like that's a bit uh, naughty, isn't it? That's like putting up a dating profile picture ten years afterwards. <laughs> They're just trying to throw us off, Richard. <laughs> so, but it, yeah, I, it is naughty. But it's 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 a way that I think that the spirit world then um, the photos that have been matched to the yes. drawings are a photo of your granny when she was on a holiday at the coast having an ice cream with her granddad and the yeah. photos match the drawing. Well, it yeah. makes sense. You want your best self. No one's going to want, you know, uh, their, their fight, the, you know, do. looking their worst in the picture. Yeah, or it's it's when the, the recipient or the, you know, the, the, the person who you're doing the sitting for, it's when their memories are the strongest with that person. 
So if they spent right. a lot of time towards the end of their life, you know, if it's if it's your granny or your granddad, um, potentially, then they would come through in a face that, that's recognizable to them. If it's someone who's coming through for a mother, well, the memories might be stronger in the earlier years, or that might be the time where the energy is pushing to bring through this healing, because the underpinning vibration of all mediumship, mm. I think, is healing. Um, so it's really unlocking those, um, certainly with the communication, that that mental paradigm or that trauma that you've got around the loss of a loved one and working on that level. Um, so it's really interesting how they choose to come through, because some of them, they come through, um, you know, like like your granny would look or you would remember. I remember mm. my granny in a probably in her 70s. You know, she lived to 99, but the strongest memories I've got were when I was younger and, you know, she was 78, yeah. you know, so she'd come through. I mean, I did one, uh, one droid, she said, and she, she said, oh, it looks like my granny in a coffin. And I thought, oh, I've not, not done her any favours here. Uh, but they'd obviously uh, had an open coffin, and, and it was a memory that was that was lasting for this, this lady who was then able to, to look at that drawing and probably process something through the healing, you know. So when um, you're doing a, 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 a sketch, what d d walk me through what's ha what is happening in, in either your mind? How is it coming to you? Um, you know, wh how does it start? Wh how you know? Just walk us through what's going on in Richard's um, world when you uh, start doing one of these pieces. Are they talking to you? Is it in it? Uh, you know, I I'm just wondering how on earth you get to a place where you've even got the pencil moving. Yeah, it's it's about the energy. You know, see, imagine stepping yourself on the platform and you're stepping into that energy. You're going, right, I'm I'm aligned with myself. I'm physically I'm here, mentally here, I'm here, emotionally, I'm I'm centered and quite comfortable, and spiritually I'm reaching out to the spirit world. I'm open and I'm aware, I know where I am. Um, so you feel that energy and that presence step in. Um, so I would do the same with the paper. So very often I'd get a pastel. Because uh, on the when you're working with the doing the Dems, I work in pastel because it's very quick and direct, and and you, uh -huh. can, you can you can get going with it. Um, is I would put that energy straight on the paper, so I would just get a pastel, scribble on the paper. Oh, there feels like there's an energy there. I feel that energy on the paper as much as I feel it around me here. And then we start normally with the eyes, normally then then working down the facial features. Um, and just going with what I, I feel or knowing that this is this is right. Very often when I put the energy on the paper, I don't know if it's a male or a female. I can do the eyes. I don't know if it's a male or a female. Um, it's very much that the same as you get a, a communicator. I'm putting red on the um, on the on the paper and I'm thinking, oh, well, this is an energetic gentleman. This is a, a passionate man. This is someone who had a real get up and go for life. So it's using the color initially. And using these different aspects of art and creativity to also draw that information out from the spirit communicator, just as you would without the um, without the art, just as you would with the mediumship. I feel that this is a. I know that this gentleman's pushing in this direction. I know that he would have liked this. And the colours that I use for the drawing. If I'm using the earthy tones, well, more than likely, this guy really liked the garden. He really liked the outdoors. He really liked nature. Mm. If I'm using the yellows, then potentially, I, you know, he was into, he, he had a thirst for knowledge or he was into healing or he was into the morning sunrise, you know. So you can start to get information wow. from the There's paper. There's so much you can do. It's more than just the, the drawing, isn't it? Because you can read into all aspects of it. Oh, it's, it's yeah. It's 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 kind of a duality in the way that you know, the, the spirit communicator is coming through on the paper independently and then the mediumship is, is coming through simultaneously, but almost you're feeling from the spirit world, but you're also drawing and putting that energy. There's a flow of energy on the paper that comes backwards and forwards for, for me as the medium onto the paper. And of course, it's it's a very direct thing for the recipient. I don't have to describe the color yellow. I can just use the color yellow. But what's happening for the recipient is they're seeing it and it, they're interpreting what it means for them. They're bringing that healing. So if I'm talking and I'm using color, it's something that can 
help the energy to really flow and really connect with the recipient. What's the reaction you tend to get? Because obviously when mediums uh, normally do platform work, well, you know, so, sometimes they get they don't get everything right and there might be one, you know, sometimes they can might read into something a bit wrong, whatever. You you get a reading and maybe, maybe it says more about the calibre of mediums, obviously, I don't know. But when, uh, what I'm trying to get at is when you present someone with a picture who's, you know, maybe not convinced about the spirit world, you must get some absolutely bonkers reactions from people because you can't deny it, can you? No, no. I mean, I'm not saying that, that all the drawings are, are, are 100% accurate, um, but they are an impression or my impression, certainly my interpretation, because it's the, the spirit world work with your skill set. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a trained portrait artist, but I'm not a terrible portrait artist. So yeah. <laughs> somewhere in between. But what they what what people normally say, they either or I've had it where the spirit communicator has gone, the the recipient will recognize the drawing. So I'll go, oh, does anyone recognize the drawing? Or they go, yeah, it's it looks like my granny, or it looks like, but when they do match them to the photograph, it's it is, it's you still get that little, oh really? Oh wow. <laughs> you know, it's it's amazing. But they but when you then get the artifacts that come in with it, when you get the other things that come in, you know, the the red car that they used to drive or the church or or whatever where down the end of the street or you know you can put these other other bits in the background almost like a little landscape behind the portrait um yeah. but yeah i mean some of the the reactions are are brilliant and incredibly humbling because i've got really no idea how it works it just does it just <laughs> does well we, we were saying before we kind of got recording that um you're the first ever spirit artist for either um, spoken to or uh, you're a very rare breed why are there so few of you um have you got any opinion on that well i i, I talk about the the history of um spirit art and it was called psychic art before and and i take back to um people like you know gordon higginson and coral poles used to work together and at that time it was thought that um coral would link in and do the drawing but then gordon would do the mediumship um and I feel that that partnership is a very rare thing to find an artist and um, and a medium that can work together. Um, there, there are a few now that are brilliant. You know, you look at sort of Paul Jacobs and Sue Wood, absolutely fantastic, second to none. Um, so looking at, at those, but I suppose in more recent years, artists have trained their mediumship and mediums have trained their artistic ability so the two have kind of married together where whether they're a portrait artist or whether they're just bringing some color or some inspiration through their creativity from the spirit world or whether they're drawing accurate portraits i i think now or i, I, I as i look at it then they're very much it's nice to be able to draw and to do the mediumship it's lovely to work with somebody, but it's very much um, an extra string to your bow as a medium if you have an understanding about colour, about what colour means. You know, you see it all the time with the orographs, Harold Sharp and that kind of thing, using the pictorial information to enhance the reading. There's there's many, I mean, you see it in all the oracle cards, all the, the tarot, all of that. It, it's not a new thing. Um, but I feel to do on the platform, to be able to draw and talk, to be able to draw accurately and to be a good medium um, and to have the, the platform presence is, is not um, a combination that is maybe that common. Um, and you certainly don't train in life yeah. for all of those different aspects. <laughs> well, they're, they're quite in themselves different um kind of uh, character profiles aren't they in in themselves so kind of merging all three i do i do perhaps see um what you're saying so do you do work then for people who maybe just want um a sketch of a of a loved one from the spirit world like commission pieces or is it sort of only assigned to the platform no no i do um do sketches or, or private readings or intuitive art so when we around the healing kind of things, there's very much that healing alignment that um, the hands on. I did the, the training at Harry Edwards 
Um, so, so became a healer because I wanted, I was interested in healing, um, but also the, the healing aspects within art. So if I give a healing or we do a healing um, for somebody, I'm, I'm more than likely going to do a piece of art that they can relate to and talk them through that, that alignment within themselves, that what the colors mean to them. Because afterwards, oh. then they've had a they've had a nice healing or a, a lovely healing. They're feeling more relaxed, more aligned with themselves, um, and then they've got a nice piece of art. It's almost like a meditation. So if you did a session and you gave somebody a meditation or an inspired piece of music to go away with, they've got a piece of art that they can link back into that healing. What a wonderful thing! I've, I want to go, Richard. It sounds most wonderful. Um, it's cool. It's really cool. It is. It is. <laughs> So there's no what? limits. There's no limits, Jason. That's the nice thing yeah. about it. You you know you you know you'll understand when you did when you get up on the platform. You've got no idea what you're going to say. You know you're almost. I'm really interested in what the speaker is going to say tonight, and it's me. You know there was that old quote, isn't there? Where the, the I could not imagine his... standing on a platform myself, maybe one day. Um, at the moment, I'm struggling just to get a spirit person to come to me sitting in my chair in the other room, let alone stand. <laughs> <laughs> I'd get stage fright. I'd run back off again. Um, maybe. Who knows? Who knows what the future holds? I'm very open-minded these days. Um, <laughs> so what what advice would you give to people then who, um, you know, are, are, are perhaps wanting to kind of follow a similar path and, you know, explore their intuition perhaps more? Not necessarily becoming a medium because I think mediumship in itself I, I, you know I my view on it is you know not everyone should be a medium it is a oh. you know uh, I think that but what I really want to sort of talk to you about because I think a lot of what you do is very creative and there'll be a lot of people listening to this who are creative who maybe think you know I want to get that spark of um you know intuitiveness or creative magic and you just seem to have that all the, you do nothing but listen to <laughs> another dimension um so everything you're doing is intuitive so what what advice would you, i'm trying to, i'm getting to the question i'm nearly there the question <laughs> is what advice would you give to people wanting to unlock their intuition and their creativity that's the question no problem um for, i mean as an artist so, so artists um you know if, if you look at some of the great artists they've they've gone through very turbulent times um, because they're dealing with themselves, they spend a you know as an, I spend a lot of time alone painting, and certainly when I'm doing the big oil paintings, it's it's hours and hours and hours spent by yourself, and I I do a lot of that in silence. I don't have music. I, I sometimes have podcasts on, um, or I have audio books, but very often I'll I'll just paint in silence. So it just opens your awareness. Um, and opens your, yourself to those, those kind of unpacking those little boxes within you. Um, for other people, I would say, look at the art in your home. Come down in the morning um, and look at the look at the painting you've got in your kitchen or in your living room and just feel what colour comes out of you that day. You go, oh, the blues are really standing out today. Well, then ask that question, well, what does that blue mean for me today? What do I need what does my body, what does my intuition tell me that I need today? So there's a lovely exercise that, that we do with uh, the physical, mental, emotional and spiritual. So get your box of pastels or your box of colours and, and pick a colour. Right. Well, what is the physical self? What does what do I feel it is uh, with my conscious mind? Oh, I'm the colour red. And then close your eyes and pick another colour. And oh, it's given me blue. Oh, well, physically, well, maybe I need a bit of fresh air or I need to go outside or I need to be near the water. So your intuition tells you what you need. And colour is such a fantastic way to really look at that. Or, you know, you, you go in your in your wardrobe in the morning and you go, oh, I'm going to wear that orange top today. And then or oh, I'm going to I'm going to wear that orange scarf. Well, what's that telling you about yourself? Because intuitively, you've just picked that up. And then feel into that. What is that? What what does that mean to me? Um, the 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 flip side of that is I I wouldn't get too fixed on a meaning for a particular color, because red doesn't always mean passion. Red doesn't always mean love. Red doesn't. It's about what it makes you feel. 
in that moment right and then to appreciate that and let it go another thing that i always say if you're walking hand in hand with someone you love in the forest red means passion if you're driving in the car red means stop so it's, i mean you're it's... very angry and aggressive <laughs> not a good driver richard stop <laughs> Well, <laughs> certainly at the traffic lights, yeah. <laughs> but it's really interesting, is it, because I think what all of this, you know, the first thing that I was going through my mind when you was discussing this is a lot of this is about being in the present moment, isn't it? You know, it's being taking more time, slowing down. You know, uh, sometimes I'm literally got my eyes half closed when I'm picking me top in the morning because the alarm clock's only just gone off and I'm jumping out <laughs> in the 10 minutes I've got to run out the front door. But, you know, I'm I'm very like that. Sometimes I just want to wear blue. Sometimes I just want to wear green. I've recently yeah. gone through a period of just wanting to wear black. But I don't think that's because I'm in a bad mood. Actually, I think it's just because I'm comfortable wearing yeah. no colour. And it's yeah. funny, it, it, colour does make me feel different things at different times. And sometimes mm. I can wear a certain piece of jewellery. Um, I've got loads of, you know, like uh, you, when, you, when you're into all this stuff, you keep buying crystals, don't you? And I need to stop. I don't need <laughs> any more crystal. That's one thing I do not need any more of in my life is crystals. I've got enough crystals now. Um, but, you know, I'm like that when I go and pick, you know, co what colour I want to wear there. What's, what would you say is, you know, I, I want to... I know this is a bit of a out there question, but what advice would you give to your younger self now? Um, you know, your teenage self being where you are now. So it's yes, a more... it's a difficult yeah. question, isn't it? And yeah, I've just put I mean, you on I, the spot now. Um, yeah, I, I take the opportunities that come along, but um, do what do what feels authentic to yourself because I think very much when I was younger I did what people expected or I did um I did things that didn't feel right for me but I did them anyway because it was either for a career choice or for a job or for something or to to do to to have something that was maybe not as authentic as it as it should have been so probably listen to that voice a little bit more um but certainly don't ever say no to an opportunity because of fear. Um, I'd, I'd do that, you know, don't shy away from things. I think that's that's really important. Um, and even now, I'd, I'd probably say it to myself now, don't be afraid to look in the dark corners. Mm. You mean of your own life? Very much so, yeah, yeah. Or the things that you know, you you maybe you shy away from because of, of of past trauma or other people or whatever. It's you know that 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 journey within is is as as I'm sure most people who uh, have worked anything or done anything within the the, the spiritual aspects of life is, they'll, they'll say the same. That that's where the the biggest gains are really is unpacking that those those pieces and and really finding where they fit within you. Um, it's very true. Um, me recently, I've been trying to shine a torch in my dark corners a bit more, um, you know. And it's is it's it, sometimes you think you know you've dealt with something and you've healed on a certain thing, and then it you know the dark corner comes back again like a merry-go-round, and then you have to revisit it again. Sometimes it's funny how you know you think you can you know have healed from something and then it flare back up again. But um, I wanted to lastly ask you and this has been a lovely conversation and i will say now if you want to find out more about richard his work um the amazing book chasing rainbows then just go to the show notes where you'll find all of the links now lastly richard i have now got into a habit of asking guests um for a final thought or a bit of wisdom that they can leave us on so over to you richard oh thank you that's very kind um so I suppose as we've been talking about that that space and and you know the mediumship and the other things and and preparing yourself and certainly for like coming on podcasts or doing anything that confidence that you need to be authentic within the moment that freedom that spontaneity of of not being self conscious of 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 not being over critical of yourself or or the fear of others judgment all of those pieces really boil down to me to to that alignment within yourself um the more that you can align with uh, that physical mental emotional and spiritual self 
the more that you can put yourself in that space in everyday life, the 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 opportunities seem to open up. You're more aligned with you. So therefore, you're vibrating on a certain frequency that would then either attract others or you would be aware of the little synchronicities that come up, like we were talking about the synchronicities mm. um, earlier on. But um, that really, that alignment piece of you, because what tends to happen is, is physically we're, 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 we're getting up, as you use the, the analogy of getting up in the morning, you're, oh, physically I'm, I'm, I'm dragging myself into the day. Mentally, you're already thinking about your to-do list and probably what you're having for dinner and, and next week and what's happening and the emails you've got to send. I'm Emotionally, terrible. I'm already thinking of tomorrow's dinner. Yeah, exactly. Um, emotionally, you're probably dragged off to, to something else than what your, your your mother's doing or your sister's doing or something that's happening. Um, and spiritually, you're, you're kind of you're, you're floating around in the ether. So I would very much say the, the starting point for all of it is to bring those aspects of you back into alignment, because then you're, you're in a, a space where that spontaneity can happen. And that's really if you look back in life at the memories that you really remember, and certainly right in the book, this is something um, that was made very, very obvious and very clear to me, that the memories that I've got the strongest connection to are the ones that I was more present and more aligned. Mm. So the ones, the ones that really resonate are the times that are really special when physically I was there and present, mentally I wasn't thinking about anything other than that time, and emotionally I was fully invested, and spiritually I was I was in that lovely space where I was holding space for myself, but also for the people that I was with, and to to put yourself in that space is very much a space that you find yourself when we're doing workshops or teaching, or very much a space when you're on the platform. And it gets you comfortable to hold space and hold that room. So the more that you can do that for yourself and the more that you can do that in everyday life, the more comfortable you are with yourself mm -hmm. um, and the more aligned you are and the more open you are to that wonderful spontaneity of people you interact with, Mother Nature and this wonderful planet that we live on. Do you know what? I think that was such good. It really resonated with me, um, part of what you said there. I think that uh, a lot of the time, being being present is the answer to so many things. But how often do are we either living in the past or we're thinking about the future that hasn't yet happened? Well, we're thinking about the present of tomorrow and not living in the present <laughs> of today. Exactly and I think that. you're right in what you're saying as well. I think that so many of us, and I think we're becoming more programmed as a society to fear being ourselves. I think social media is feeding into that, but we, you know, people can't really feel that they speak their own truth and there's nothing more refreshing than speaking your own truth. So I totally agree. Richard, thank you so much for coming on the SoulSync podcast. It's been an amazing conversation and I've loved talking to you. Oh, it's absolutely my privilege. Thank you ever so much for having me, Jason. Privilege. Thank you ever so much for having me, Jason. Well, there we go. That was the incredible Richard Stuttle. And that conversation really did touch my heart. It's really great to have you here with me on The Soul Sync. Do remember, if you want to know when the latest episodes are out, all you need to do is follow or subscribe wherever you listen to your favourite podcasts. And like I said at the beginning of the show, over on my YouTube channel, I've been documenting some of my um, experiences, journeys, uh, with the spirit world, how my mediumship is going, and also I've been recording some videos about lessons learned in my life, and I'm gonna be releasing one very soon about how to get ahead in your career, because I know I've mentioned it in previous episodes, but I um, started from very humble beginnings and uh, I built my way up to owning a uh, national business, and I wanna share some of these valuable lessons with all of you, the lovely listeners. So if you wanna go over to my YouTube channel, all you need to do is search Jason Paul Soul sync so that's it for this week's edition i hope you're having a good week it is the summer solstice if you haven't li listened to uh, our full moon meditation by the amazing kieran morgan that is also out now so that's it until next week a massive big goodbye <laughs>